so good evening and welcome to 120 Dublin Stories with Santa Rita and the Little Museum of Dublin. So this week we've got a special event to mark Heritage Week and I am delighted that our guest this evening is Leslie Ann Hayden, the coordinator of the Museum Standards Programme for Ireland within the Heritage Council. Leslie Ann, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. I've been looking at the list of previous speakers and I feel very privileged. Thank you. Oh, delighted. It's, um, uh, I guess kind of in, in turn, we feel very privileged to be recipients of the uh, Museum Standards. And so it's nice to have the opportunity to actually talk about what the programme is and a little bit about what it means in the public space. So I have a million and one questions, so I'm going to just jump in. Um, just because this is a programme that's run by the Heritage Council, you might just start by introducing us to the mission of the council. Oh my gosh, if I had known that immediately, I'd have done more homework. I'd done more homework. Um, I suppose the Heritage Council was, was established in, in the 90s and it was established as a semi-state body. And it has a number of areas of heritage in the act that established it for which it has oversight. Um, sort of wildlife, built heritage, etc. Um, but also included in that are heritage objects, which is where the Museum Standards Program comes into it. So I suppose where the Heritage Council is now, and also it is looking at its mission statement again, its heritage and the community is very much to the fore for the Heritage Council and its thinking. Although as a body, it advises, it, it advises on policy to government. Um, with regard to the areas of heritage. Uh, and I suppose if I think of what my colleagues cover within the Heritage Council, you're talking about planning, built heritage, um, gosh, heritage in schools, um, uh, National Heritage Week, all of these sort of many, many programs. If, if people go and look at the website and just click on programs, you, you'll be surprised at all of the links across Ireland. So, so, it, so in many ways, for a very small body, currently there's about 14 employees, but watch this space. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think in September there, there will be an announcement with regard to the capacity of the Heritage Council to do more for the sector, um, but um, with, with a very small unit based in Kil Kilkenny, sort of it has a, a very great outreach mm -hmm. and the programme is just one, one element of it and I'm engaged and have been engaged in, as a consultant by the Heritage Council to oversee the programme. Amazing. And I think this um, very conscious focus on community is, um, I, I guess, for organisations like us, it's wonderful to see that the priority is being explicitly staged as such yes. it is so important yes and so kind of just to ask you specifically the museum standards program just explain to everyone what it actually you know what it is well the museum standards program is an is essentially an accreditation scheme and for those of you in business, you'll be aware of ISO, the International Standards Organization. And so I had experience actually of accreditation. I lived in Canada for a good few years and my last role was as a human resources generalist for a, 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 an international relocation company and they provided the creme de la creme of services. Um, and part of my role um, in, in human resources was actually, there were 15 branches across uh, Canada and the United States, was to make sure and check that each of these branches were going to meet their, the ISO 9000, which is the customer service standard. Mm. So when it came to this opportunity, when I was back living in Ireland, and then it was just known as an accreditation scheme for Ireland, um, the Heritage Council had been testing this scheme for about three or four years. It was actually overseen by the Museum and Archives Officer then, Ethna Verling. And when the Heritage Council was established, it actually, with the idea of heritage object in mind, it went to the sector and said, what would you, what would you like us to do? How can mm. we best assist you? And one of the things they said was, well, in other countries such as the UK or Australia, New Zealand, countries in Europe, 
United States, Canada, they have accreditation schemes and they are able to benchmark how they look after their collections and how they offer their services to their visitors and manage their museums against a set of standards. And we don't have that. And in the 1990s and now, <laughs> there still is no policy for, for museums in Ireland. So really anybody can set themselves up as a museum, but there are lots of serious museums, whether they are run by volunteers or their companies such as yourselves or trusts or local authority museums or cultural institutions. And there wasn't a set of standards to benchmark um, the, the work that they did against. So the Heritage Council working with 12 assorted different types of museums in Ireland um, worked to establish what would work best for the Irish museum sector, but also looking at what is going to meet international best practice as well. So the museums involved ranged from cultural institutions such as the Chester Beatty Library and the National Gallery. There were local authority museums such as Monaghan County Museum. There were volunteer run museums such as Museum Corcogrina in Ballyferreter in County Kerry or and the Hunt Museum, um, a mid-sized museum, um, a, a sort of a company limited by guarantee. So there were an assortment of museums and I, I, I wasn't involved at this stage, but sort of there were experts from mm -hmm. Ireland and internationally who advised on the various standards and the standards themselves ultimately can be seen to be divided into three sections and that is governance and management, caring for collections, collections management and visitor services. Mm -hmm. So over a period of years, various standards were tested and we, the programme, ended up with 34 standards. They're minimum standards, although the museum is working through the program sometimes, I think. It depends. You all have what you're really good at. Uh, the visitor service mm. end and, and, and sort of for, for, for some museums is, is, is the area they excel and they have to think, oh gosh, policies or strategic planning or um, registration systems and things like that. But there's no museum that starts off the program where, where they're not excelling uh, or exceeding at least one or two of the standards. Standards and, and some more. So um, after a pilot study, the Heritage Council um, reviewed the recommendations and accepted and adopted an accreditation scheme for the Irish museum sector, and this was in 2004. But the 12 museums, all they had got for their efforts was, thank you very much, and I've seen a photograph um, a plate, sort of a, a craft plate. It was about this big. They're all, and I've seen them in, in some of the museums and so on. Um, but then there was sort of a time lag. Um, but I, I came back from Canada in 2003 and was doing other things, getting my feet back into the um, Irish sector and working in Ireland and being in Ireland. And I saw this job advertised and it said, we are looking for somebody to um, facilitate this program for us. And um, an interest in museums would be useful, but it's more the organizational end of things. Mm. So actually I, I combined, could combine both. I have a degree in history of art. I have either volunteered, I volunteered in museums as a docent in Canada. Um, I had joined the Ontario Museums Association. I dabbled with the idea since I graduated and I actually did the arts administration course. Um, the, the prototype for it, which is how old I am, which eventually became the Diploma in Arts Administration in UCD. Um, and I'd worked for Sotheby's um, for a few years uh, and, and then before going to Canada. So I could demonstrate an interest, but also I could demonstrate I knew what accreditation was. Anyway, I was interviewed and they offered me the opportunity. And one of the first things I had to do was to go around and introduce myself to the 12 museums and say, do you think the program that you worked for is a really good idea and should it become real? And all, all mm. 12 said, yes, please go ahead. So then um, other aspects of the program had already been agreed, like the sort of uh, sort of how we, we have 
um, it's, it's a three to five year program. So it takes on average about three to five years to achieve accreditation. There are eligibility requirements. Um, the, we have assessors, so it's a bit like externs come to you at a certain stage and they review your exam papers, so to speak. Only you yourself, Sarah, will know that it's more than just an exam paper. It's a huge application that, that you put together <laughs> and you put together several, several times through the process. Um, it was a couple of times the size of my my college master's looking back on it now <laughs> absolutely only hopefully it wasn't just you involved i mean i would always be saying that there should be more people involved but just collating the thing um and i i think it was from our from the little museum's experience of going through the process i do think and I, i'm sure i was frustrating at points in the process but i do think that the opportunity to actually force us to stop as a team and to actually sit down and have kind of directional conversations was a really valuable opportunity because to be blunt about it, I think we, you know, we can all be, we can have moments where it's very difficult to actually just stop and take the time to think and talk. So it was, it was definitely one of the privileges that came out of that experience. Um, but just when you're talking there, one thing that I don't think I've ever asked you this question before, but it just kind of strikes me like, what was the decision-making process in terms of making the call that it was collections-based organizations specifically that could apply for the scheme as opposed to the kind of the wider heritage sector? Well, that would become because it's, it's, it's a scheme for museums. Mm. And when one goes to what is the definition of a museum, a museum, a museum has to have an original collection. Now, some of the uh, one or two of the applicants may not own their collections directly, but they're set up like the Hunt Museum is the Hunt Museum um, Company Limited by Guarantee, but there's the Hunt Trust behind that owns its collection, although the Hunt Museum is also now collecting in its own right. Or for mm -hmm. instance, the GAA Museum is responsible and set up as a company limited by guarantee, but it has an, it has, it, it's, it, well, it agreed a 25 year agreement. It's probably about 10 to 15 years into that agreement with the GAA. So if you give anything to the museum, you're actually giving it to the GAA. But that, those are fine points. But I suppose where it comes from the Heritage Council, there's two things. It's a program for museums. So to be a museum, you actually have to have an original collection. Um, a good few of the standards are related to caring for a collection. Um, so while many of the standards could be very useful to pass for organizations and heritage centers that don't have an original collection. As you said, the program gives an organization a chance to sit and think and discuss with one another, who are we, what are we doing? And in the case of a museum, what are we actually collecting there? What is our collection policy? Um, and are we in fact collecting and how much can we collect? Do, can we look after what we collect or does that limit how much mm. we can collect and really make us focus in on what we do? And strategic planning um, the, mm. and financial planning and sustainability. There are, there, there are museums out there who, especially volunteer ones, who might have 5,000 euro through the door, they look to get to grants, but the volunteers essentially do a lot do a lot of the work and they may or may not open their doors with community scheme employees to, mm. to assist them. So even at a small museum, um, actually thinking financially about what you do, but it all comes back. I, I think in terms of, I once did myself sort of a, a little pyramid and what were the standards and you and you had sort of at the center were collections, but then you had the museum, the governance and management, visitor services and, and collections management itself. But essentially the, the mission of the museum ultimately Mm. covers all of the standards, everything you do, and part of what you do as a museum is collections related. But then mm. if we come back to what is the purpose of the Heritage Council or what is its remit, obviously its remit comes in with regard to heritage objects and 
archaeo well archaeological objects are, 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 are the purview of the National Museum, etc. Mm -hmm. But lots of museums or many museums, not all museums, um, may have archaeological objects in there. But essentially, it's that heritage object idea. Mm -hmm. um, and so it started, the Heritage Council starting point was the collection, but for a museum accreditation scheme to be viewed on a par with international schemes, mm -hmm. the collection, um, you can't, you can't actually be eligible to join the program without a collection. Um, so, but as I say, I have, I have met with organizations that have actually looked at the standards or from time to time because the program is a program because it's both an accreditation scheme and training as we can give it mm -hmm. to, to support the museums to understand the standards. And so on occasion, organizations that may not have had sort of they've had a good link into the program or let's see what it's about or they've been thinking about mm -hmm. collecting and so on so we've we as far as possible from time to time have opened up the program for training because mm -hmm. the training if places are available can be offered to those outside the program it's managed training but um, those who come knocking on the door in many ways come to some training workshops, meet some of your potential colleagues in the program and then decide if the program is for you. And, and so I think the, the more education and the more knowledge that there is within the sector, you know, that is, we're absolutely. all going to be in a better position as a result of that. Yes. Um, yes. It's, it's inspiring to hear that that's the way, that's the way that it works. And I just thinking about the standards, I can imagine while we sit here on Zoom having a conversation, I, I can imagine the realities of the last 18 months must be interesting in terms of the questions that they're making you ask yourselves about, you know, the evolution of digital technologies over time and the ways in which museums are moving their collections, their conversations, their outreach initiatives online, as well as the kind of traditional in-person format. And I kind of wonder, is, is that potentially going to be a future element? Well, they're standards. So to start off with, what each museum does, if it meets the standards per se, hmm. means they can be accredited, which is why the National Gallery with conservation labs and, and so on, has the same level of accreditation. The Crawford Art Gallery received an accre its full accreditation certificate this year. The Thomas McDonough Museum in Club Jordan, which is run by volunteers with CD Scheme, have achieved the same level. The same level as you yourselves have achieved. So everybody's achieving the same thing. But I'm not avoiding your question in that when the standards were agreed, even if you, who knows the application form, if you go down to it, many of the general questions don't refer to technology that we now now use. In other words, the application form even may be sort of changed to, do you use Zoom to our teams or how do you communicate? Do you, do you now communicate online with, with, um, with, with your audiences or your visitors and, and, and so on? And I and there is no standard with regard to how you present yourselves online. So as you yourselves know, we, we did um, a survey of the program last year with a view to the next stage that the mm. program will become. It hasn't been forgotten, but there's with, with COVID mm. and the, there's sort of we're at the stage where the Heritage Council has adopted the survey, but my colleague Beatrice Kelly is, is away um, on sabbatical at the moment. So when Beatrice returns towards the end of the year, we will be actually getting onto the implementation stage of that. Now, it will be based on sectoral need, but to reflect the sector and looking at what other programs might be doing. But if you are presenting yourselves through the web, part of your education programs through the web. Yeah. I can imagine looking at it from the perspective of is there consistency or mm. in the same way as the standard with regard to how you present and interpret within the museum, mm. is I there an it. equal standard with regard to how you interpret within the museum? The Heritage Council will never tell you what to say, mm. 
you yourselves mm. at the Little Museum of Dublin and how you how you present yourselves and interpret yourselves with both panels and guided tours, etc. Other museums may just do guided tours or other museums may not have the staff that you do. And so it's it's it's, it's courses for courses. Mm. But I can, I can see that. And also from my perspective, um, the application which we've described, which is very thick, sort of, I think it may not, it won't be next year, it won't be the year after, but perhaps at a certain stage when you yourselves are doing maintenance, maybe not the next maintenance, but the maintenance mm. after, it can all be uploaded um, okay. di digitally, et cetera. But with, yes, they're, they're, looking, at, they're looking at standards, but. As, as you know, di digital and what museums have been doing, it may be a conversation such as we're mm. having here this evening. It may be exhibitions online. A lot of museums have moved to putting their exhibitions online. Some museums were already doing that. Um, the Edward Worth Library, which is in the program and can only be visited on appointment, um, has, has actually been putting together online museums well Great. on you but museum exhibitions well before covid so part of how they are viewed in how they present themselves and their museums in when they did their first assessment to benchmark what they were doing when they talked about exhibitions their exhibition story included the online so okay. it would be how you present yourselves but then the assessors will look at black and white standards and say within the context of that mm. are you meet are you meeting that i can remember years ago when a lot, some of the museums still ha didn't have websites. We actually, um, we actually put on a training program and what's the minimal for a good web website. Mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of the advice was, well, people often search for where you are and they can't find you. So put it front and center. So in mm -hmm. other words, from a customer service perspective. Um, but again, it'll be what, what you can afford. So, so I, I'm, if, if, one, if I go and look um, at the, uh, the website of the National Gallery, they might offer more. I could go to the Metropolitan Museum in mm. New York and I could be doing virtual visits around the Met or yeah. something. But even now, if I go and look at the National Museum site, um, I, can, I can take myself very jerkily because I'm not that skilled, but I can go around the Natural History Museum, mm. which is actually closed at the moment for refurbishment. But it has, it has been um, sort of there, that there is a virtual exhibition that's been put up. So I can imagine it'll be taking that into account but accreditation is black and white so mm -hmm. it'll be no that you can't that's... say that you have to do online in other words no. for registration purposes you mightn't no. have a formal museum software program to manage your collections and uh, and so on you could still do it all on card index files but you still yeah. have to do it properly <laughs> yeah which sounds horrifically stressful with a collection of thousands and thousands of pieces um and I think like that was I I think that was my experience of the process that was our team's experience that while there is a set number of standards it really is about having the conversation to see how it relates to your specific circumstances and to tell your story as opposed to try and fit into a one-size-fits-all which is not I guess the reality of our sector um, and it, it you know it's just it's hearing you talk about the Heritage Council and the, kind of the work of I guess kind of establishing and building the standards like I think it has it is fair to say they that you as an organization the support that you've been giving us as a sector in the last year really it has been really admirable and really very much appreciated um, with all that's been going on and I kind of I was just reflecting on that before coming into this conversation this evening and I kind of realized that because the nature of your work has you interacting with I guess many museums on a regular basis I kind of I wonder if you have any observations on how the sector has found the last year or two um, or indeed kind of what you think might be in store for the sector as we kind of recover and rebuild in the coming years? Well, I think starting off your, your, how, your, the choice of recover and rebuild, because I think coming out of it, there is opportunity. 
Mm -hmm. um, I, I am aware there are, there are 59 museums in the program across Ireland. There are six, 65 sites essentially. And I suppose what, what I've seen is there are those museums that are local authority or national cultural institutions. And they, they have, they had the financial support to keep on going. Um, there are Office of Public Works, historic property sites in the program. So I suppose I, I could observe those museums whose staff were sent home and could continue to work. And for those museums that had to submit applications for accreditation last year, while at the very beginning, um, I can remember having a conversation um, with Beatrice Kelly, the head of policy and research in the Heritage Council. And she was saying, can we actually run a program? Mm -hmm. um, partly it was because um, as you know, you yourself know, there's an on-site visit component mm -hmm. to it. Um, but by that stage, um, I'm also a member of the board of the Irish Museums Association and Gina O'Kelly had taught me how to use Zoom to attend <laughs> meetings and things like that. Perfect. And after a few Zoom meetings and things like that, I said, you know, Beatrice, with a, with a bit of work and museums willing to do this and supply video requests and working with the assessors, etc., it will be possible. We can do on-site visits through Zoom and things can be uploaded and videos can be seen or they can take their laptops around and show show storage areas and things like that. So there was that there were those museums in the sector who had some financial support and um, a lot of those while some of the look well I'd say about half of the local authority museums do charge an entrance fee half didn't half don't and so on and so forth. So, but they were able to carry on at home or they, as much as the Heritage Council did, there would be a rotation where at a certain stage you could come in on your own. So museums personnel were coming in to check on collections from time to time and so on. And those who were working on the standards had actually more time to work on the standards and think of policies and have meetings and, and so on. So in many ways, without the distraction of running a museum, mm -hmm. uh, and I won't say it was easy, there was probably more thinking time um, mm -hmm. from, for working at home um, because I was surprised in the end at how very how little was required after the site visit that there than there was normally because there had been a lot of preparation time and for me because i couldn't visit i'm i'm, I'm on an embargo and i i do visit museums personally but i'm not allowed to visit in the name of the heritage council e even now i had to pivot to working through zoom and meeting with museums and doing my pre-visits and and so on but then of course, there's the volunteer run museums who, some of which for COVID and trying to manage COVID um, and the requirements of that. And the expense of that, well, there's an expense for everybody is you put up screens or your signs or anything like that. So sort of decisions had to be made. And I, and I know some museums didn't open. And in fact, I know there are some museums that only reopened for the first time this August. They didn't open last year at all. Or if they've been thinking of opening up in January, <laughs> then, then that, that all came to a halt. And that included local authority museums, because again, it all depended because not all museums are the same. You'll have local authority museums with larger staffs or smaller staffs, or just whatever the policy is for, for, the, for a particular local authority. Mm. And then there are the commercially run museums. And in, in, in other words, there are museums that are not-for-profit companies limited by guarantee, etc. but like yourselves, a lot depend on the income that comes through the door. So it was among the museums of that type where they are successful. They are seen as successful. I, I'm mentioning no names, but I sort of, I sort of, I had a conversation. Sort of, we've been so successful that the subsidy that we used to get from government with regard to running sort of is now only worth twenty percent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there were museums who, rather than send their staff home, actually furloughed their staff. Mm 
And so, or, or they furloughed some of their staff and those who remained just had to, were coming in and checking the collections, et cetera. And until they could open their doors and, and start taking in money um, just to, for the cost of running the service mm. that, that they do. So, so every, but everybody adapted and there are some museums out there that weren't able to open just because of how they are configured. So I know mm. Henrietta Street, for instance, um, I'm not sure if they've been able to open yet with because guided tours and just the amount of space, etc. And I know Kilmainham Jail for the OPW. Well, a lot of its properties have been open because of the configuration of the jail and the visitors. I actually just looked on their site before we came on and they did. They were planning to open up at the end of July. So I think they are open and you mm. can come and visit certain parts of, right. of the jail. But you can't do that if you're going through narrow jail corridors. That's that's not socially distanced. That's very much so. That's not socially distanced. And I think that is kind of I, I, I would agree with you that the kind of the challenge of it's something that we experience here as well because indoor guided tours aren't yet permitted to resume you know you are offering a different experience to that which you would have previously and you know it it, it is an experience it is an opportunity to innovate it is an opportunity to try new things and like I, I you know our team have been incredible in terms of how how much they've undertaken in all the changes that are going on, but it is looking at the whole sector, regardless what the organizational status is, it has been a really yeah. challenging time. Um, and I, I kind of, I don't know, I guess on the kind of one idea that I'm thinking about a lot recently, I kind of, I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts. Um, you know, you were talking about kind of basically the different funding models that run the different museums there a moment ago and in making kind of in making the argument as to why we as a sector need funding need support need you know support I'm always interested about how we as a service or how we as an industry create value for the public and so I kind of I don't know I think when we're talking about creating public value, generating kind of interest and engagement with our cultural and heritage sector, you know. Well, I think you've been missed. I know mm. I missed you, <laughs> um, but 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 the value of this, if, if you if you think at the moment, one thing I didn't talk about were the museums that actually had the capacity to their educate if they had educators and so on the educators were suddenly reaching out and doing online work mm. so the glucksman gallery were running art programs and so on or th this program like this zo mm. zoom talks so i'm very much missing my glass of santa rita wine <laughs> And and, and 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 that I was thinking, should I come? And I said, no, I I I have a New Zealand in the fridge at the moment. We will um, do it in person soon, hopefully. <laughs> but but uh, but but so uh, and and if if I think of museums that wouldn't have a lot of money, but the the museum, the Shackleton Museum in Athai run an annual conference. And this year, their conf last October, their conference went online. Mm. And actually a lot of museums were reporting that they've actually reached out to not only their local audiences, but audiences around around the world. Mm. So you had polar heads for the Shackleton Museum who who would not normally be able to come to Ireland mm. or w Ireland once in a blue moon and maybe have this on their 10 year bucket list or something. We're coming to a five at the Shackleton conference and mm. so on. But actually they could attend and they've they've actually reached out and sort of made sort of more contacts, mm. which which with regard to the main thing is recording it because mm. if I if I come back down to the standards and one of the standards that I find you don't do it because I know the little museum or commercially run museums really see we have to know who our audiences are and um, so that we can demonstrate 
that hmm. we are meeting that value um, and so on. So I often sort of find that museums, the recording of who, who their audiences are and where they came from and understanding their audiences is something that perhaps is more difficult for some museums th than others. But it is one of the standards and is actually, if, if, if you know your collections, you can tell your stories. If you mm. know your audiences, you can tell the right stories to your audiences or you can actually challenge them mm. um, uh, if, if you wish uh, and, and so on. So they're, 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 that, that question of providing value. Now, as, as the coordinator of the museums, when I've seen reports and so on and Creative Ireland or whatever, and I'm looking down and say, where is museums in this? Why are museums always forgotten? Um, or sort of let's sort of get sort of and museums. It's it's mm. sort of the art sector and sort of it's like with the, the sort of and museums and, and understanding. But I think as you've had to close or as people are going going around now on their vacations at home and so on, I think museums are responding to mm. to that and welcoming people through their door and 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 it's it's but it's take this opportunity now as mm. perhaps you get people who are more local to you have may not been through your door before to actually ask them what they thought of the visit while you're trying to social distance and if you don't charge at the till then the opportunity to talk to somebody and if you're shy you sort of put the person who's not shy <laughs> if mm. you have a not shy person at mm. the front just to ask and get feedback mm. um, from those visitors about what they enjoyed and and use that information um, to to consider strategically where you are going to take your museum so so i i do think coming out of this museums are going to be looking at things like blended education mm. Hopefully, they will. Your, the commun that their their importance within their own communities will have become more focused for for the local co community and 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 who they are. And I and I think just I think we've all come out of this really having a sense of what what do we really value? Mm. What's what's important to us? And and how have we survived and for museums it's also as they can say when did we go through something like this before mm. what was the spanish flu epidemic like yeah. in dublin <laughs> for instance um and, and and so on so museums can help interpret that um and so on and yeah i think it is that idea of looking to the past to kind of ask questions about the future is yeah. it has led to some very interesting conversations and um like because it is one of those things I kind of like what you're really what I'm picking up from what you've been saying there is basically the importance of nurturing the relationships and really utilizing this as an opportunity to do exactly that um and like I know as you kind of as you mentioned earlier in the conversation you know you yourself come from kind of a HR management background kind of throughout the course of your career um, rather than kind of exclusively working within the heritage sector and the museum sector. And like, I kind of, I guess one thing I'm curious about is I would be of the opinion that museums very much sit within the tourism industry and the hospitality industry, as well as heritage. And I guess I kind of, I'd love you just to reflect on the responsibility as you see it for us as a sector for museums to actually build those relationships with the public to have quality customer care and customer service and kind of hospitality skills and really living up to the the kind of irish cade meal of Fulcher that people hope for when they come here yeah yes i suppose and i suppose if one looks back at what museums were and and sort of almost closed and an exclusive sort of uh, sort of the cabinet of curiosities and sort of almost um sort of you you have to be washed to come through the door almost or or or, or, or in your best clothes to come to the museum um where where it's sort of we are caring for collections so the curatorial element sort of is 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 now 
has moved to be on sort of it, it, it is equally important but that visitor service element and understanding and and the welcome but also the raison debt yes if you are looking at if you're the if you're trinity and you're looking after the book of kells then you are looking after a very important object to the irish nation the Arda Chalice in the National Museum, the, the Caravaggio in the National Gallery, etc. Sort of there, there are important objects that are important to sort of sort of to, to that are part of the national patrimony. But if you think of the objects that are in your museum and the photographs that are behind and the stories that you're telling about you too, or the molten prints. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I have done a secret shopper visit. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, uh, uh, sort of, sort of te telling sort of that, that, that value Part of it in, in, in understanding your audience is being able to help them understand what's of interest to them or themselves or their history, etc. And a lot of when I when I look about what's being written in general about museums and what they can do, they're 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 very much front and center at the moment about sort of sort of I, I've seen articles on how museums can help with climate, the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. For instance, at the Lexicon in Dunleary, there's an exhibition that's just opened up about climate crisis. I was looking mm -hmm. through what's on for Heritage Week and just clicking here and there. And mm -hmm. the National Museum has a talk on the climate crisis mm -hmm. uh, and, and heritage and the coast and things like that uh, and so on. So museums are, are sort of their, their, their collections can be equally contemporary or the stories that they can tell as, as you yourself has said we can use our collections to reflect on the past but we can also use them to reflect forward and we can also be offering a service to, to the community so yes part of the tourism sector so before the little museum opened if you came to Dublin who was mm. telling the story of Dublin um, yeah. so I, I know that Trevor and Simon uh, Simon O'Connor Trevor White and Simon O'Connor very much saw that there was a space in the market <laughs> um, to use a commercial term but yeah. but to act to actually um, to tell the story of Dublin and yes to the tourists coming through the door because you're mm -hmm. front and center you're on Stevens Green you go up the steps the door is wide open I used to look at the door askance sometimes and think oh the dust is flying <laughs> through the door but actually you have spaced your collections away from it but the door is open so it's wel welcoming to come to come through but when you come through sort of and and when the museum started off, it was sort of it was on the first floor and then it's grown and mm. you've had loan collections and now you're building your own collections. But you 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 are I very much feel you are interpreting Dublin to Dubliners mm -hmm. as much as you are attracting the tourists. I sat yeah. down and looked at the little film and you have to have an understanding for the Dublin accent. <laughs> Oh, the <laughs> chances guide, yeah, <laughs> and, and 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 so on. But but mm. but sort of, and I just felt that that's great for schools. It's great for tourists and what have you. But I really get that more probably than a, than the tourists coming in, sort of with the Vikings coming in or or, or the custom mm. house dropping down or or whatever it was. And things. I'm like um. I, I I'm in hearing you say that means I know you've been into us recently. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> Um, okay, but yeah, and that's, you know, I think that's very consciously something that we try and do, but I think it is really important that you help orientate a guest who is coming to Dublin for the first time. But then also if, yeah, if the museum of the city doesn't have things for the locals, you're, you're definitely doing something wrong. And so it is, I kind of, I genuinely like to believe that we do offer something for yeah. everyone, but it's, it's, yeah, it's lovely to hear, um, it's lovely to hear your thoughts on that and like so obviously we are a recipient of the museum standards program accreditation and I kind of I guess I wonder just charting the progress and the kind of the process of it as a as an accreditation program I kind of wonder if you could tell us a little bit about you know has it evolved that much in the time 
that you have run it and then kind of by an extension of that like when you think about the program 10 or 20 years from now what's your hope for it okay <laughs> um I, I i suppose i sort of it, it's i i would see the way it has evolved because what's sort of very for the, for your visitors and what have you this this book is 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 what the little museum and the other museums has gone through with its 34 standards etc and those standards are as as set in 2004 but there was an upgrade with regard to the text element and making it <laughs> easier to understand etc but i think what we didn't know at the beginning or the heritage council didn't know and you start with 12 museums and then you add it was advertised then um and i think there were 40 or 50 applicants and a further 12 were offered an opportunity so it doubled and then another 10 etc so it grew over the years the one thing that hasn't grown is the fact that it was me myself and i back in 2005 2006 and it's still just me but the heritage council with the review etc is looking at the capacity of the program um but what to me was the surprising element of it but also i think even comparing we our assessors are made up there are now we are building on our irish based assessors mm -hmm. um but our assessors, so we have externs from the UK Museum Professionals, Northern Ireland, and the assessors from the Republic of Ireland. And the assessors from the UK would comment when we started doing surveys and so on. And what was coming out of the survey of the museums in the program, what's the most important thing to you? And the most important thing to them, apart from the support they were getting, and but not the most important part was, meeting with other museums there's there's one quote that we use in one of our brochures my sense of isolation has gone um because the so so i think what has evolved and which has helped the 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 irish museum sector and those who are involved in the program is a network of museums mm -hmm. so that sense of being part of a network so when when i'm trying to help museums i'll, I'll uh, and, and or they ring me up and say can can you help me and i'll say well this is my two penny worth but why don't you go and see such and such a person mm -hmm. and from the very beginning um i sort of i i, I thought mentoring when, when a new museum comes into the programme, it has to be assigned a mentor. And, and as you know, we have an orientation, sort of a sort of welcome mm -hmm. to the programme, welcome to the cult mm -hmm. or whatever, and come to Kilkenny and we'll give you lunch and, mm -hmm. and okay. now go and do the work. But if we can, sort of, we'll also, if, if they're available or if we can, we'll also invite and introduce you to your museum mentor. At this stage, I can't remember what the, who the little museum's mentor. It would have been a museum in Dublin. It might have been the National Print Museum or, or something like that. Can't yeah, and the GAA. It was the GAA. So, so it was Joanne Clark and the GAA Museum. Um, so I, I think sort of giving, sort of being that sort of the, the sort of the conduit through which the sector could start to talk to itself. Now it did meet obviously, and the Irish Museums Association is very important to mm -hmm. the Irish museum sector and membership of the Irish Museums Association and the programs that it runs and its annual conference and an opportunity to get together um, on an annual basis as a sector and talk to one another and to, to get the benefit of whichever theme the, the, the Irish Museums Association is presenting that year. And it's like the educators get together for the annual education forum. And then there are other um, programs that, that, it puts, that it puts on. But the program is itself, I think, because you're all working towards the same end. Mm. Um, sort of, it's, it's given a chance uh, sort of for sort of, Sort of for, for the Michael Davitt Museum um, and Yvonne Corcoran Loftus to be talking to Tony Candon, who 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 is now no longer who's sort of who's 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 now retired, but was the manager of Turlock Park, the national the National Museum there, and so just down the road. But the introduction has has happened. Mm -hmm. So the program has it has 
has evolved, I think, for, from that perspective. And also looking ahead for the museums that have accreditation and so on, it's what can we offer more? So when Monaghan County Museum, um, when Liam Bradley from Monaghan came to me a couple of years ago and said Monaghan have developed a diversity education program, which we think could work for museums, it's taking that opportunity or bringing mm -hmm. or working together with the Irish Museums Association on, on bringing somebody across to help the museums understand what's involved with GDPR when that, that mm. came in and so on. So mm. in many ways, it's these are minimum standards. Mm. So I'm but not I, saying that we should be raising them, etc. But I would hope the fact that the museum standards program is still here. Mm. And the fact that the museum standards program is accepted by the sector, because when I started, um, I had a two year contract and um, part of that contract was to see if the program was actually a sort of, it seemed as though it was something that could work for the sector, but did the sector want it? Yeah, and <laughs> they it's, did. It's um, but, but that wasn't necessarily, um, it sort of, so I got another contract. <laughs> Good. I in a, in a funny way, you know, you are like the MSPI is in a slightly similar situation to the little museum in that if the individuals that you are trying to create value for don't want that value, it, it, it's not going to survive. And it's, um, yeah. And when it, we did the survey last year, you all had to respond. So it, it had to it had to look as though it was owning its bread and butter. <laughs> well, it's, it's, there, there it's were, I mean, not sort of that there, there, there were criticisms and part, part sort of one of the criticisms is that you, you should be sort of people outside of the sector should know more about it, which is why I'm very happy to be coming on this evening to, to, talk, and about, it's, to talk about the program. Um, mm. and sort of and, and the success of the program, but also what it means that museums that having achieved accreditation, what museums are demonstrating that that they're they're doing on behalf of their visitors and their collections and the professional level, it's raised the professionalism. Um, I think I, I think actually I, I, the I council comments was on, was commented very early on on grant applications and said you can tell an MSPI applicant among the applications because they're succinct, <laughs> but they they they've had to think. And know more about mm -hmm. who they are and what they are. So I, I think it probably helps them put. They already have it down on paper to present when mm. it comes to putting in applications for whatever they're looking for. Like I do, I do think that when we received the MSPI, my kind of my sense of it was it kind of it established that we were kind of a little bit more grown up than we were prior to that point in terms of how we were kind of we, we were showcasing that we took good practice serious. And I think that as an assurance, when you are taking into your care collections and artifacts that have emotional and kind of historical significance and personal, I guess, value to a large number of stakeholders, I think that opportunity to really protect that reputation is so vital. And I, I kind of I think like I'm I'm amazed to think that we're actually kind of coming to the um coming to the end of the conversation but I, I kind of I guess I I wonder when you think to the future of the museum sector the heritage sector with your you know Irish Museums Association hat your MSPI hat on to kind of end on a high note what are you most hopeful about? Well, I sort of, I suppose if I actually think about how 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 museums have moved forward even through this, mm. so I, I'm not sure where you're at at the moment, but I know you're planning with regard to refurbishment, redevelopment, etc. At the little museum. I know a Thai Heritage Centre is looking to expand into the library that moved out and it is continued and um, 
uh, the, the curator there is telling, I think they're now sort of at the process that the questions that she has asked over the years have just grown and grown in complexity. And who should I speak to, Leslie Ann? And who should I? And so now we're at the stage of almost the builders coming in and start and starting mm -hmm. to work. Um, if you think there are two new museums that have just opened up in Waterford during the pandemic, which sort of the Silver Museum and the Clock Museum and so on, the Butler Gallery moved to its larger premises in, in Kilkenny, a magnificent premises. So if any of your visitors are going to Kilkenny, do, do go to the mm -hmm. new Butler Gallery because it now can show its collections. It, it's, sort of, it, it's sort of expanding from, it used to just have its own collections on display for one exhibition a year. Now, now it, it's, sort of, it's, it's magnificent to, to, to go and visit there. And I, I, I would hope that choosing the Museum Standards Programme and the professionalism that has come from it, that museums themselves have the ability to actually tell their own story and, and make their own arguments for themselves, but with the support that the programme has given, has given them to have a level of confidence to do that. And um, for, for me, a, a sign that there's a success would be that you're not looking down the list when there when there are these um, reviews being done of the sec the, of creative sectors, shall, shall we call shall we call it? And you're saying, well, the museums are part of that, but have they forgotten them again? So 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 to bring to to bring that forward. Um, but yeah, no, I I think they're sort of. While I would advocate that capital development and just opening a museum, you really have to think about it because the, one of the problems has been that money has been available from, from various sources to open museums in areas if, if, if there are local groups, but it's the ongoing running of the museum, which mm. is equally important and thinking, thinking, about, thinking about that. But I, 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 would, I would hope that the museums have an opportunity to embrace their visitors coming through the door now mm. who, who they may not have had, who may not have been coming in before and and really showing showcasing what what they do now it's difficult you've got screens you've got covid etc but i think it's the welcome i mean i i do come from a customer service background as well so so for me that they're sort of the welcome. You're welcoming them into your home. Come, come with us, and 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 let us show you what we have. And and there must be something here that's going to be of interest to you today. Or talk to one of us, and we'll tell you about it. <laughs> I think um, I think that kind of that perfectly kind of brings our conversation to a close. Like I know from the Little Museum's perspective, you personally and the Heritage Council more widely had been so, or have been so welcoming and supportive of us as an organization over the we've been going through the MSPI process. And I think it's really just, I'm seldom given the opportunity to thank you and recognize that in the public forum. So just to sincerely say, we do really, appreciate everything that you've done for us so thank you're, you you're very kind because i i i've been i've been given well i have a great job in that i go <laughs> around and visit museums and i speak to people and everybody has their passion whether it's mm. copper mine museums or thomas mcdonough or sort of it's, it's 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 just trying to help and i suppose that human resource element in 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 me um and and i also used to do recruitment and i love to sort of see people developing so it's given me an opportunity mm. to both mix my the museum side of me and and anything that i learned because i had to leave ireland to earn my living um and then bring, mm. bring it back here so i would also thank the heritage council for the opportunity that it's given me um to, to work with museums and and for the sector and in sort of in in, in welcoming me through their door and so there's many times i'm sure you've went oh God, <laughs> <laughs> not at all, not at all. No, sort of, oh, and I've said, no, just a little bit more. <laughs> We're better off for it. But um, I think, listen, there's lots more 
um, Heritage Weeks go, uh, Week events going on. So oh, there, 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 there are, there are. I, I was a guide at Avondale House and I was looking to her and saying, Samuel Hayes, who's Samuel Hayes? And I said, oh, he's the person who is the Irish parliamentarian who um, actually designed and built Avondale House, Charles Stuart Parnell's home. I, mm. sort of, I worked as a tour guide there. And there's new suspension bridge across the, the mm. across the Avoca River, etc. And at this time, there, there's the, they're, they're halfway through their guided tour and talk of the area in Red Bath Drive, wow. Campbell Hay. So um, sort of it all comes together. So there's a lot of heritage. There's over 900 events happening. Some of them are online and I, as some of them, there's an opportunity to go and do talks and walks and things like that. So I mm. hope that your hair, I know you've been doing sort of into St. Stephen's Green and things like that. So I, I hope that they go well. Oh, it's been really yeah it's been really wonderful but um wonderful sure there's lots more to experience before the week is over but to everyone who's joined us here this evening thank you so much for taking the time so our guest this evening as part of this special heritage week 120 dublin stories which the little museum presents with santa rita estates we've had leslie ann hayden the coordinator of the museum standards program for ireland so thank you Leslie-Anne, so much thank, thank you. you good evening thank you bye